evening. It is a great pleasure to welcome you during today's discussion about the potential of economics to lead us through the looming challenges of our times. The discussion is organized by RESES, Rethinking the Serviceability of Economics to Society project, which is the argument funded project by the sponsored by the Finnish Cultural Foundation and led by Dr. Emra Aydinonat from the University of Helsinki. RESES aims to improve the public understanding of the role of economics in policymaking, economics worldview, its power and its limits. RESES also attempts to identify the capacity of economics to renew its agendas to better fit with the new demands. Today's event would not be possible without the joint efforts of the RESES team, particularly Anita Valikangas, RESES project or coordinator, Jessica North and Tem Ulari. The topic of our discussion tonight is, is, is inspired by the recent book, How Economics Can Save the World, Simple Ideas to Solve Our Biggest Problems, written by Eric Angner. And the author of the book is here with us tonight, and he will join the conversation with other distinguished uh, speakers, Outi Hanpera, uh, Sixten Korkman, and Mina Ulikano. Dr. Eric Agner is professor of practical philosophy at uh, Stockholm University, where he directs the philosophy, politics and economics program. He specializes in philosoph philosophy, methodology and history of contemporary e economics, as well as in behavioral and experimental economics. Dr. Outi Hanpera uh, works at CITRA, the Finnish Innovation Fund, and she leads CITRA's Nature and the Economy team. Outi is an expert in environmental economics. Dr. Sixten Kochmann has worked as a professor at Aalto University, as director of Etla Economic Research and IFA, Finnish Business and Policy Forum, as well as and the, as a director of the Economic and Financial Affairs Council of the European Union. He is Finland's important economic expert. Dr. Mina Ilikano works as senior expert in the Ministry of Economic Affairs and Employment, and she is adjunct professor in the Department of Social Research at the University of Turku. She is a specialist in the study of social policy, in particular on topics of labor market and, and employment. So welcome, welcome everyone. We are delighted that you found time to join us here tonight, and we are looking forward to our conversation. My name is Magdalena Mawetska. I am assistant professor at Aarhus University in Denmark, but and docent at the University of Helsinki, where I'm leading the project on the transformation of modern economics by computer technology. All right, so let's start. The public of the countries in the global north is increasingly concerned about the present and future state of economy, society and nature. People living in the global north are not only concerned, many of them are also the most directly affected by the consequences of the problems such as climate change, exploitation of labor, inequality and the conditions of living in poverty. Economics plays a role in the debates about how to tackle economic how to, how to tackle chal chal the challenges of the climate change, how to alleviate poverty or decrease inequality. No wonder. Many of these global and regional challenges have economic aspects. They affect wages, management of natural resources or wealth of social classes. Economics is also widely debated because the tools of economic analysis are an important part of governance by contemporary states and international organizations. The apparent lack of success of economics in making substantial improvements in relation to the global challenges of our times has led some scholars and activists to insist that mainstream economics in, in fact justifies the capitalist economic system with its extraction of natural resources and unequal distribution of wealth. Therefore, critics argue 
mainstream economics may be part of the problem and not the solution. We often hear today, we need alternative economic frameworks and approaches to properly, to properly conceptualize and address the socio-economic transformation that, for instance, the challenge of climate change requires. Against this backdrop, Eric Angner remains an optimist about mainstream economics. By, dis by discussing some examples from economic research, he, he encourages us to think about mainstream economics as a repository of tools, and not to worry too much about the content of its models or, th or theories, as many critics do. The book is, in, is an invitation to defend the value of mainstream economics as a policy and socially relevant science. So tonight, we will engage with Eric's arguments, but also, and, e and equally important, we will discuss in more detail the extent to which economics-based solutions to climate change and poverty are or can be successful. We will conclude the discussion with reflections about the future of economics discipline and, and profession, in particular with respect to its ability to be indeed useful for society and polity. So now, without, without further ado, let's give the floor to Eric. Eric will introduce us to the main points of his book, and then we will move on to the discussion. Thank you, and Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Magda. Thank you to the other panelists who are here. Thank you to everybody in the audience who uh, ventured out on a long weekend to join us to talk about one of the driest subjects on earth. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure to be back in beautiful Helsinki for this conversation. I have some slides, I believe, if we are ready to fire those up. Here we go. I want to take as my starting point the notion, which I think of as relatively popular, relatively common, that science, when judiciously applied, can be used to help us live better lives and to build a better world. And I want to add that that claim holds also for economics. Now, you might think that if somebody accepts the first claim on the screen, that they would also accept the second. But you'd be surprised to learn the number of people who, in general, like science and its uh, prospects for better living, who nonetheless reject the notion that economics can do anything of the sort. You might be looking, for example, at um, op-ed pieces. Every year, literally every year, The Guardian, um, a newspaper in the UK, publishes a paper around the Nobel uh, season when they argue that uh, economics is not a science, it's a religion, economists are no scientists, they are priests, the econ price is not a real Nobel, and they're trying to trick us into uh, accepting the interests of the uh, uh, capital, big capital and the big corporations and so on. The Guardian, I guess, is a sort of left-wing outlet. There are similar claims being uh, promoted, uh, pushed in right-wing uh, literature. So here's the New Republic, which I guess is like a center-right kind of publication. The title here from the other year is May God Save Us From Economists. Um, and the end of the introduction there says it's time for economics to back the hell off. People feel very strongly about the role of economics and its prospects. The same thing is true in uh, books. If you search for economics on Amazon or something, you might find a book with a title like What's Wrong with Economics, um, Economic Myths, Various Ways in Which Economics Gets It Wrong, The Anti-Economics Textbooks, License to be Bad, How Economics Corrupts Us, uh, The Econocracy, The Perils of Leaving Economics to the Experts, and this goes on and on. It wouldn't surprise me if there are literally a hundred books on this general theme telling you that not only is there a vast supply of materials like this, but there's also a significant demand for this kind of literature. I'll end with my favorite, The Death of Economics, featuring a hangman's noose, maybe hoping, uh, predicting, or wishing for the death of economics and the execution of the economist. This is relatively unusual, I think, as far as science is concerned. Like, every science has detractors. Evolutionary science comes to mind, chemistry comes to mind, but there's something unique about economics in the kind of vitriol that it attracts. 
If you look at this historically, it turns out that the kind of anti-economic writing that I showed you is nothing new at all. In fact, there's a book called Economics and Its Enemies, which traces the history of what the author calls anti-economics all the way back to the birth of the discipline. Since the very beginning of the discipline back in the 18th century, there has been a group of thinkers, a sort of shadow tradition that denounces its practitioners, attacks its assumptions, rejects its conclusions, and protests its, its influence. Now, um, I, I want to start off by saying that I sort of get it, right? If you look at the economists who appear in the media, present company obviously excluded, right, it's not a pretty bunch, right? They don't make the profession look good. Um, now, funny thing, right, if you look at popular culture, I can hardly think of like a single positive role model who's also an economist. Like, can you? Like, there are no good-looking people on television acting as economists. There are some really bad-looking people doing this. So this is from inside the movie Inside Job. If you've seen it, you know what, what I'm talking about. If you haven't, let's just say um, the movie does not make economists look very good. By comparison, many other professions look good. So here's Eva Green in one of the James Bond movies. Um, She's an accountant, right? This is what accountants look like on the big screen, and uh, uh, you know what the, what the economists look like. And um, I'll confess that um, not only do I get it, but I've also engaged in this sort of uh, behavior as well. I'm sort of a reluctant economist. Um, I have also disapproved of what economists have been doing in the public eye. Many of the things they have been up to have been uh, very bad, I think, for, for all of us. But um, something has shifted, at least to my mind. So w the, the sort of anti-economics that we've seen today is being, has been a sort of innocent fun, I think, for the chattering classes until the era of Trump and Brexit and whatnot, when uh, anti-intellectual developments became very strong. So in an era of widespread science denial and knowledge resistance and so on, the anti-economic literature has become less um, fun and more ominous in tone. And I think, in fact, that the kind of um, wholesale dismissals of the entire enterprise can be positively harmful. So, um, it behooves us then, I think, as people who uh, like science, who believe science has something to contribute to social problems, and who know a little bit about economics, to talk about what economics does. Now, abstract arguments aren't going to cut it, right? What we need are like, actual stories of people doing research that is in some way useful, possibly even enjoyable. Um, I think, um, and the book argues that economics taken together offers tools that allow us to live better lives and to build a better world, a world fit for human flourishing in just the manner that med medicine cures disease. Now, it might, be while, um, it might be worthwhile to stop up for a second and reflect on what that means. I take it that it's true that medicine cures disease, given the way we use these words in everyday language, but that doesn't mean that every medical intervention is automatically effective. Right? It doesn't mean that 100% of medicine works. It doesn't mean that medicine is the only thing that works. It doesn't mean that medicine works magically and on its own. It needs to be applied by a careful practitioner with a decent sense of ethics and maybe aesthetics as well, and with a view to the values of the people on the receiving end. And I think in that sense, we can say truthfully that economics helps us save the world. Um, how do you make the case? Well, you have to make the case by sort of describing stories of economists who are doing good. I'm not going to bore you by telling all these stories. I just want to show you like a sample. It's not quite a random sample of economists, but they're nonetheless uh, uh, well-established mainstream economists, um, some of whom have earned the Nobel Prize, who are doing research that isn't just intellectually stimulating or uh, uh, interesting, but uh, actually useful in the sense that it gives us hints about how to build a better world. If you look at this body of research and you try to generalize, there are some common themes that emerge. 
One of these themes is that um, economists tend to start with a big problem of some kind. Economics often gets described as sort of a purely intellectual, mathematical enterprise, and it is that to some extent. But many of the most prominent economists out there start off with a big problem. So uh, financial, a lack of financial literacy, um, a, a lack of organs, um, unsustainable business practices, communities that end up over exploiting resources, that sort of thing. Many of these economists also start off with a theoretical framework. So again, this is something economists often get criticized for, like having so much theory. But the theory turns out to be really useful. In many cases, the theory was developed without a, uh, a particular application in mind. Um, as in the case of the organ donation story that I tell, the economists involved built a theoretical model entirely out of intellectual curiosity with no view to practical application. And then it turned out that the model captured what was going on with kidneys that are in short supply, right? And so they could apply this model to this real problem. As uh, people in philosophy of economics know well, like economists use models for all sorts of purposes, um, and the models are, the theories are terrifically useful. Another thing that these like, very successful economists have in common is that there's a lot of data. Again, economics often gets criticized for being sort of too far removed from the world of experience, from empirical facts, and so on. And there was a theory when that was true, at least to a greater extent than it is today. But economics has gone through something sometimes called an empirical turn, which means that it now pays a lot more attention to data, sometimes gathered in the laboratory, sometimes gathered in the field, sometimes gathered by means of randomized controlled trials, and sometimes gathering, gathered from national statistics agencies and, and so on. The data gets uh, analyzed with the use of advanced statistics. Right? In many cases, the statistics serves to identify what the causal relationships are, something which is obviously absolutely critical if you want to use the information for policy purposes. This point might surprise people a little bit, but in many of these authors, there is explicit attention to values. So many of these economists, the, the uh, most prominent ones, the most important ones, spend a, a, a significant amount of time talking about the values they're trying to promote. So Al Roth, for example, dedicated his uh, keynote lecture at the American Economic Association meeting one year to the question of values in economics. He says that economists cannot ignore values, in part because values influence people's behavior, and people's behavior is what we're studying, and in part because the analyses themselves and the solutions that we're presenting reflect values in various ways. Eleanor Ostrom, who's one of the economists who was on the board just a second ago, Talked about, talked about this a lot. She was trying to help communities solve resource problems, which is something that some communities succeed in doing and others do not. And she was really concerned not to be the sort of person imposing her values on the population. She ended up drawing the conclusion that the economist should act as a sort of midwife, helping communities develop solutions that work at the proper scale, given their conception of the problem and given their values. It doesn't always work, but economists are sensitive in many cases to these sorts of concerns. And then finally, there are um, simple, actionable courses of action that we can adopt in order to live better lives at the individual level or to build a better society at the collective level. So um, again, economics doesn't offer like magical wands or silver bullets. The um, advice is not 100% guaranteed to work. It's not the only thing that works. It doesn't work typically on its own. So medicine is typically administered in combination with advice about diet and uh, uh, company maybe and uh, healthy practices and exercise and so on. And in the same way, the sort of advice that a social scientist might offer is not going to work in and of itself. It often needs to be applied in conjunction with other sorts of, of informa information. But short of like magical wands and silver bullets, economics and the other social and behavioral sciences offer the next be best thing, strategies that are actually based on evidence, which means that we have reason to try and reason to think that they will work. 
Now, I don't want to be up here sort of defending the orthodoxy, and in fact, um, I want to end by talking a little bit about how economics could be better. Because it is true that once you think of economics or any other social and behavioral science as a tool for improving the world, it becomes painfully obvious how the actual economics that we're seeing out there uh, falls short of the ideal. Here I'm talking about economics, the idea of a systematic scientific approach to social phenomena. I um, am not even beginning to defend the economics profession, which leaves many things to be desired. But there are some ways in which um, economics decidedly needs to be better. Um, we need to improve it. Uh, we don't uh, want to discard it together, but we need to improve it. And um, just like three things that come to mind. One, um, economists are known for being not very humble. Um, this is interesting because humility is one of the things that economists study, uh, but the ones who are visible on television anyway often come, come across as sort of arrogant pricks. That is very unfortunate. Um, economists should be a good deal more modest, I think, especially given how much they have to be modest about. Economic interventions should be applied a little more judiciously with a little more attention to local conditions. A pattern, I think, historically and internationally is for economists to develop some solution, present it as a one-size-fits-all solution, and then descend on some country someplace implementing that solution. That's pretty obviously not going to work, right? Because local conditions vary, values vary, and so on. And so I think just like the domain of, or the discipline of physics has a whole domain of engineering that attends to issues of application of the science to real life problems. It would be wonderful if we could develop a discipline of economic engineering or some such that pays more attention to how you translate the, empir the theoretical or empirical results from the science of economics um, into like actual uh, solutions to real problems. And finally, I think economics could be a lot better integrated with neighboring disciplines. Economics is famously insular. If you look at bibliometric data, economists cite non-economists at a much lower rate than, for instance, political scientists cite non-political scientists. And I think this is um, the... The need for integration with neighboring disciplines is particularly I acute in the case of philosophy. Why is that? Well, think about some of the legitimate critiques of economics that pop up every so often. Here are some things that people object that are absolutely legitimate. One is that economists tend to put too little weight on the future. When we do cost-benefit analysis, we often go out and ask people how much they value various changes and whatever, you know, who don't have a voice in those sorts of exercises, well, it's people who don't yet exist, right, or children. So in so many cases, we put very little weight, if any, on future generations. That's a shame. Economists very often use a sort of parochial concept of efficiency. It's a technical term in economics. It means something very special. That concept of efficiency is often very different from the kind of efficiency that people in the real world adopt. And that means that the sort of advice that economists might be carrying need not be responsive to the sort of concerns that actual people have. There are examples of economists whining that real populations don't have the same values that the professionals do, but that's a problem for the professionals, right? Not for the uh, population, at least not necessarily. Here's another thing. Economists don't pay enough attention to issues of distribution and inequality. Historically, I think this is definitely true. It's changed a little bit recently. The explanation, I believe, has to do with the roots of economics in classical utilitarianism, which does not care about the distribution of utility, right? It only cares about the total mass of utility or the average level of utility in the country. And finally, um, the complaint that economics uh, ignores that which really matters. There are values in life that matter that aren't captured in economic models. That risks meaning that economists ignore those things. Now, all of these are legitimate critiques, I think, of the way that economics is normally practiced. But if you look at these sorts of critiques, they're really not about the science of economics at all. Um, 
narrowly construed. These are questions about values, right? How much value should we put on future generations? How much value should we put on equality? How much value should we put on concepts of efficiency that don't match the concepts that economists are using, and so on? And so these sorts of critiques aren't, strictly speaking, about the science of economics at all. They're about the values that get integrated into the theories for purposes of policy interventions. These things need to be improved, but the way to do so is not to improve the descriptive theories um, necessarily. The way to do it is to integrate more reflective, consistent, normative reflection into uh, the process, and that is precisely what, what philosophy can deliver. So uh, to conclude then, um, I think economics can in fact, help us save the world. It can solve small problems, it can solve big problems, it can solve problems in our personal lives, it can solve problems on a collective scale. None of it is magic, right? Um, it's always going to involve proper judicious application. It's, we're going to need practitioners with sensitivity to local conditions, local values, ethics, and aesthetics. But if we do that, and we use the theory wisely, we're far better off with it than we would be without. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric, for your excellent and engaging talk. Uh, before we move on to the discussion, I just would like to um, tell the audience that you can post your questions via streaming, via streaming, uh, service, as well as via Twitter. But at the end of the session, we will also have time for uh, in-person questions. Just, just you can do both. And when you are posting your, qu your questions, please, you can also do it in Finnish if you, if, you, uh, if you prefer. And that's also the information for everyone who is listening to us now online. All right, so let me open the general discussion of the of the, of the Eric's book. So I would like to ask you, even though you alluded in your talk a little bit uh, on this, but I would like to ask you about the motivation for writing the book on this topic for general audience. And of course, we all agree that doing this by academics is very important. Many of us should do this exercise much more often, if ever. Yet, didn't you think that engaging with your fellow philosophers on the topic, on the topic also of defense of econ mainstream economics in the way you do, wouldn't be worthwhile? So the question is, why the book now? Why in this format? And why this audience? Well, so I guess there are different levels at which I can answer the question. To some extent, I've been working on this project my entire career. Like these sorts of questions about the proper use of science and the policy domain is something that I've been thinking about for a long time and that I've always wanted to articulate. Um, the timing has to do with the rise of sort of anti-intellectual fact resistance and um, uh, skepticism and, and so on. But then when it comes to the choice of venue and um, format, I mean, I spent plenty of time talking to other philosophers. Um, I'm like a halfway moderately successful philosopher, but the average number of people who read or cite my work is like vanishingly low, right? The sort of work that I do, I can spend five years on a book and it gets cited like once or twice a year. It's basically like shouting into the void, right? It's totally pointless. And um, having some ideas to convey, some ideas that I think matter, um, you need to find a format to communicate w where you meet people halfway. Because um, obviously there's a huge audience out there who care about these things. Right? They read the anti-economic textbook. There are lots and lots of people out there who are curious about these things, who haven't had the opportunity to study economics for like 15 years or something, and who might be interested in, in reading this. It seems important to me um, to get word out. And then, to some extent, I want to do my part when it comes to making positive change. So things like climate change, 
there's a chapter on climate change, right? E economists are virtually agreed about the solution to climate change, and the solution is to tax the hell out of the companies that produce the carbon dioxide, you know, and to crank the tax up until the problem is solved. It is remarkable how the profession can be so agreed about this, and the vast majority of people have never heard of this proposal. I have colleagues who work on climate change who've never heard of, of this proposal, and this is a problem because it's not enough to come up with the ideas, right? They need to be implemented, and if they're going to be implemented in a democratic society, they need to be legitimate. You, somebody needs to explain the rationale for them to the people who are going to suffer the consequences. The politicians need to understand these ideas, and so we need a lot more um, exchange of ideas. Like this is a classic. So I'll uh, finish after this, but this is like a classic point in economics, right? Division of labor is wonderful. Like, not everyone can do everything at the same time. It would be a massive mistake if all of us tried to build nuclear power plants and write economics textbooks at the same time. But the division of labor only works if there's exchange, right? If there's intellectual exchange, if there's a marketplace of ideas. And what I'm seeing is a lot of silos in the academic world where the philosophers don't talk to the economists and, and the other way around. I know Helsinki is different, but this is true in so many different places. And um, people in the ivory tower don't talk to people outside of it and the other, the other way around. And that's a shame. It allows us, it prevents us from taking advantage of the benefits of division of labor. Thank you. I, we will come back to the climate change solution a little bit later, but before that, I would like to ask our panelists for sharing their general impressions, comments, and ideas about the project. So maybe we start from OT. Yes, very nice to be here, and thank you, Eric, for the for the uh, for the book. It was a very nice nice read, and I enjoyed it. And I kind of liked your approach of like being a bit positive, and I think we need positivity uh, at these times. Maybe a little bit of my background so people understand uh, where I'm coming from. So I lead a team called Nature and the Economy at Citra. And when I talk about nature, I mean both the living and non-living parts of the nature. And our objective is that uh, we need to make nature visible for decision makers because we completely de depend on nature and nature is quite often uh, invisible for decision makers. And they need, we need to make nature visible so that uh, we can make better decisions. And before joining Citra, uh, I lived in the UK for uh, over 10 years. And then I also lived in Ecuador and Nicaragua and Indonesia. So I'm an economist by training. So I, in court terms, I plead guilty when we talk about uh, this profession. But about the book, uh, yes, I said I like the positivity and... Um, and different uh, examples you can give uh, where economics can be uh, applied in, uh, in personal life, more in kind of uh, societal to address uh, social problems, and then these big, big uh, global problems such as uh, climate change and poverty. And um, maybe one uh, thing I would like to raise is this, uh, you said that we need to be humbler, and maybe this title <laughs> of the book is, is quite big, and I understand that to sell books, you need to have big titles, but maybe need to be a bit more humble. Like you know, we economics, we cannot save the world, and we can make definitely make contributions if we use our knowledge wisely and if we work with other prof professions wisely. But uh, maybe contributions and not kind of uh, solving the the issue. And and maybe my question to you, if you have uh, time to reflect that, did you think about biodiversity when you uh, picked up climate change as the kind of global topic? Because there's actually quite a lot of research, economic research on, on, on climate change, and we have solutions, but I think we really uh, are further behind on, on biodiversity and how to actually address this issue, because it's a huge economic issue, issue as well. Thank you. So we can, we can collect the comments and then uh, Eric will have a chance to reply if he wishes to. So Mina, please. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eric, for the presentation of your book. It's, it's really interesting. I think uh, I've never read anything so um, kind of like Famous Five I've wrote here when I made my comments. It's like Famous Five reading a book about uh, kind of uh, expanded to, um, experimenting new ways of uh, thinking of economics. It's really 
making me thinking that if I've thought about economics totally wrong, even if I've actually studied economics. I started my, my studies in Berlin, I think in the 90s, in economics. Then I came to Finland and, and continued my studies in economics. But I, I found it really quite far from reality. And at the time, at the University of Turku, um, in the Department of Social Policy, they have these very, this great um, international research groups. And I thought, I, I, I want to be there. That's the place I want to be. They really can combine the reality with <coughs> economics. They think like economists, but they actually think further. They think what happens in reality, and they can capture the social dilemmas, social problems, and they can answer them. And then I, I changed my major, and I um, have my PhD in social policy. Then afterwards, I finished my economic studies. And I think it's a good combination, but alone, if, if I only studied economics, I, I think I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't have studied basic income, I wouldn't have studied what I've, um, or researched what I've researched, and um, <coughs> I think this, this book is, um, is it's really good because I, I think I'm going to carry it with me my um, rest of my life, I think, because it's, it's really making me think, how should I think about economics? Um, and how to, if I, if I was um, teaching economic students, I, I would make them read this book and I would discuss this book with them. This is, if you showed the picture of the dull looking economist talking on, on television, this is not dull, this is very interesting, but you're not an economist, you're a philosopher. I think you're, you're not only economists, you are also economists, so you think more widely. And I think what's common for all the economists you ref, uh, refer to in this book are actually not only economists. And that's one thing I'm, I'm thinking when I read this book, that um, is it actually, and I think you also ask it here in your book, is it only economics that can save the world? And it's not. But it's a very good book. And I think we come, Back, for example, to Sledgehammer later, I, I, I'm born in the 70s and I think I've looked all the episodes from Sle Sledgehammer. And I, I theory, I, at that time I didn't think about economics and, and now I do. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sixten, please. Well, thank you. I uh, had to pause when I started to read this book because I started, of course, with the very first two sentences which uh, state as follows, I never meant to be an economist, if anything, I meant to be the opposite, which made me think, reflect for a while, what is the opposite of an economist? I, I didn't find an answer, but now it's not needed because you became an, uh, an economist in the end, so, so you are an economist <laughs> and that. This, I, I would say, like the previous speakers, that it was a very nice reading of this book. It's highly enjoyable, it's very well written, it's easy to follow, easy to understand the arguments, <laughs> and it's refreshing to have a book with a very different perspective from the uh, ordinary maximization of utility by the rational individual plus supply and demand. So, I mean, you leave out that story and that's for the better of it. And I think the, it's interdisciplinary, which is useful. There's a lot of psychology and you are obviously an expert on behavioral economics and it has much to offer us, which is very interesting kind of reflection. So uh, that actually, I think the, in my view, the best parts of the book all of us are, I would say these, which uh, exploit the behavioral economics aspects. Uh, it's serious and evidence, and economics has gone very much forward in that area since I started it many, many decades ago. I'm aware of that, even though randomized experiments, unfortunately, can't be done in every situation. Sometimes you don't have the counterfactual. So it's not the problem solved. Uh, there is a chapter on social norms, which I found very illuminating. It's all also dealt with to, to still them. I would agree, I think the previous speakers perhaps already went into it, that that occasionally you do promise a little bit too much. I mean, starting from the title, how economics can save the world. Well, it can't. I mean, and I think you would agree now because I noticed when you had the title here up, you had added the word can help save the world. And I think it, 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 it's needed. I don't blame you for this because uh, excessive um, modesty is not useful when you want to sell something. So, I'm, But uh, I would say, a Finn wouldn't do it like you do it. Uh, a Swede can do it. That's, there is a difference in national character. But let me say, I, I don't believe that uh, economics can uh, solve the problems of the world. Needless to say, 
good economics is a prerequisite. It's an important element. But you need uh, uh, lots of other elements. And e even if we would talk only about economics, I don't think you will find all the elements here which are needed. Uh, you say very little about globalization. And in my view, the most important problems in today's world are global. You don't say anything about financial instability, which is a threat all the time for us presently as well. And you don't deal with the fact that during the past decades, as a consequence of globalization, technological developments and economic policies pursued, particularly in the Anglo-American countries, we have ended up with instability and inequality of such terrible magnitude so that it has fed the populist movement, which today is a threat even to the United States. So I do think if you want to save the world, you need to have, in a way, deal a little bit with these matters as well. You don't even mention the word macro, so I, I must say, I think it, uh, that it's the macroeconomic part which is somehow missing out of, of, of this. I think that's, um, that's uh, so in a way, uh, then one additional comment on, I, I enjoyed the, uh, your comment, you say, ignore the self-help literature, uh, turn to economics instead. And then you go into the business of self-help, in a way, because you are giving a lot of advice which is very unusual to the individual. Economists usually talk about markets and the institutions. You tell the individual how he should think about the world and how he should uh, improve his uh, breeding of his children or how he should be humble, how he should get rich. And in all of these, you give a lot of, of advice to the individual. I think they are good advice. I think you, you are much better than the most of the self-help literature. But you are in the self-help literature uh, in a way in that. But uh, again, I liked that. Still about this, uh, can't uh, avoid teasing you a little bit on, on this issue of humble. You just told us that economists should be humble. Well, do you, do you live as you teach, one could ask, because as, uh, as I said, you're, you are not particularly humble. But again, to repeat, I think one shouldn't be too humble when one is putting forward ideas and trying to sell them. So this is a very nice book, and we'll come back to some problematic issues, I think, in the subsequent rounds. Thank you. So, Eric, a lot of praise, a bit of criticism. <laughs> Yeah, so please. <coughs> Th thank you so much for these comments. This is very interesting. Maybe I should say a few things about the constraint of the genre. So writing a trade book, as in a book directed at a broader audience, is um, a very different kind of task from writing for other academics. As a matter of fact, like you guys up here are not even part of the target audience, right? The target audience are, you know, the people in the in the street. And what happens in this sort of writing is that, one, the title is out of your hands, right? The publisher will pick your title. Um, the marketing department uh, will do that for you. Um, you have to make very sharp de decisions about, very harsh decisions about what to include and what to leave out. And you have to explain everything in terms of um, stories. And you have to use, ideally, a 12th, um, uh, sixth grade level language, meaning you have to target, like in your mind, a curious 12-year-old. <coughs> so this means that there's a lot of nuance that gets left out. There's a lot of like, topics that you don't even touch on and so on. When it comes to macro in particular, I don't get macro. Like I took the entire macro sequence at the PhD level, but the only thing we ever did was solve dynamic linear uh, uh, programming problems, which is of absolutely no use to understanding like globalizations, globalization or interest rates or anything like that. I'm hoping maybe one day somebody else, maybe one of you, will write a similar book about the macro themes because they're no less important. It's just that I'm not the person to, to write that. The point about humility hits particularly hard because there's a whole chapter on humility, right? <laughs> but um, so when, when it comes to like pitching a title, what you have to do, like in academic writing, you start off by saying, here's my definition and here are the conditions and if so and so and under these assumptions, then some, something holds, right, X. But if you're writing for a broader audience that isn't like paid to read your book and that doesn't have an exam, uh, to sit when they're done with it, you have to somehow grab their attention, right? And the rule is you make your point and then you qualify it later. And so what I did here was I worked with the title, like how economics can save the world, and then I explain inside the book what that means. And the explanation is that it can save the world in the sense that medicine cures disease. 
you can say that without assuming that it's guaranteed to work, right? You can say that without assuming that it's going to work in and of itself. You can say that without assuming that anyone can apply economics and save the world, right? Clearly, that's, that's not the way it works. But thanks again for your comments. I'll, I'll uh, reflect on them. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I, I suggest that we move to discuss specific topics that the book mentions, but that also, I think, are very, very rich in terms of thinking about the role of economics in addressing them. So you write about climate change and one of the solutions to the climate change. Uh, so let's start from this topic. The urgency of the task of addressing climate change is obvious to many. The debates uh, about reduction of carbon dioxide emissions, about climate adaptation or mitigation, range from discussing the main factors driving climate change, right? whether climate change is mainly caused by the capitalist economic system or by human activity, irrespective of the economic system within which humans operate through estimations of costs of benefits of climate action or inaction to the specific solutions, market-based ones, such as cap and trade approach or carbon tax that you also discuss in the book. There are proposals of moving to circular economy, ideas of how to fund the green transition through mobilizing uh, financial system, uh, and finally, more radical calls for the growth economy. So, my invitation to our panelists now is to, or question to you, is to how to make sense of all these debates and proposals and to reflect how important or promising is reliance on economics to think about solutions to climate change. And I suggest we start from Oti, who is an environmental economist, mm -hmm. and she, she has been thinking, and not only thinking, also doing a lot about uh, actually addressing climate change through economic policy as well. So please, Oti. Yes, um, and of course I understand that you said that this was written for a general audience, and hence it has to be you know, simplified. Uh, but I think kind of reflecting what uh, Sixten just said, maybe f yeah, framing climate change as this wicked uh, problem, it's a complex problem, and hence there are no silver bullets. So I think that sh we should uh, be super clear about that, that there are no silver bullets. And um, yeah, I, I think probably there isn't an economist uh, on earth who would uh, kind of be against carbon taxes. It's an efficient uh, tool. And then the question is that if, that if it's such an efficient tool and uh, putting a tax on carbon, especially kind of like starting from the production side where um, uh, businesses or factories, firms who produce uh, carbon emissions, they need to pay for them. And hence they take that into account in their decision making and you know, change their business models to something else, maybe to cleaner technologies, uh, clean energy, so that you know, they, will, they don't have to pay for the tax. And it could be also an emission trading scheme, not only through a carbon tax, we, we could put a price on carbon. So the uh, solution is simple, but the, I think the real question is that if the solution is so simple and powerful, why only 23% of the global emissions are being priced at the moment? And um, even when they are being priced, the price is much lower than it should be in order to uh, to tackle climate change. So maybe I think it would have been super interesting because you are a behavioral economist to, to maybe play a little bit on this behavioral side. Is it just because our politicians are so stupid? Even we economists like yell, yeah, like, please put a uh, price on carbon. And you mentioned this. I remember how many Nobel economists uh, in the US have been, you know, have put forward this proposition that please put a uh, price on, on carbon and then circulate that money being collected back to the economy by giving the money to people. We could either lower, lower uh, uh, labor taxes or just give lump sum transfers to people. And even after all these debates and discussions, still the Biden government decided to go on with this uh, Inflation Reduction Act, not putting a uh, price on carbon, but actually giving massive rebates 
on clean technologies in a hope to, to advance clean technologies and re, uh, to reduce emissions. So there is, it's a political economy issue, and I think that that's maybe missing, missing a bit here. But of, of course, I said I'm, I have a background in this and those other things that I would have loved to, to learn more. And also, we've been working at Citra on environmental tax reform. So the idea is the same, please let's price, put a price on, on carbon or more general in natural resource use and then give the money back to the economy by uh, decreasing labour taxes. And I think Sixten, you were uh, on a panel when we released this study and the feedback was so positive from left to right. You know, we never had, we all, quite often we are criticised <laughs> on our work, but this time everybody was super happy and yes, let's do this. And the proposition even went to the government programme back in um, 2019. But actually what really happened is that there was a small environmental tax reform being implemented. So it was in the government program and they kind of did it what they said, but it was a very, very, the scale was little. It, it, didn't, it didn't kind of, uh, the opportunity was not actually exploited as it could have been. So I think that's the, that's the real question, why something that is on paper so powerful why the politicians, why they're not keen on, on making those decisions. Would you like to reply, Eric? Yeah, let me just respond quickly. So I think this is a fantastic question. Like, if these ideas are so great, like, why don't people pick up on them? Why didn't they already, right? There are $100 bills on the sidewalk. Nobody's picking them up. But in short, I mean, this is a question way above my pay grade, right? It's a political question. Like, why aren't these ideas being picked up? And I imagine there's a combination of factors. The corporations that would be taxed probably don't like this one bit, right? I wouldn't if I were them. Um, uh, can I do anything about that? Maybe not. But part of the problem, I think, is that people don't understand the logic of the proposal. It's not that hard, right? You can explain it in a page or something, but people don't know it. Like I said, even academics working on climate change couldn't explain the logic. And that's the problem, I think. I mean, the first step is to get word out that this exists. The second step has got to be to build coalitions, right? How do you build coalitions? Uh, with people in the, you know, with activists and academics and uh, mm -hmm. civil society and, and so on. Um, I don't know, but that's got to be the focus, I think, going forward. Sixton. Yeah. Ah, yes, I think I read some years ago a book by uh, the British economist Nicola Stern, which had in fact the title, uh, the, the title, Why Are We Waiting? which is, in a way, the question that you have just uh, referred to. And because we do have this solution, be it then the carbon uh, tax and carbon dividend, or be it trading or permits, but that could be a big part of the, of the solution, and yet it's not fully implemented, even though we do have at least the European uh, trading permit system, which is improving gradually. But there are a lot of difficulties. There are these vested interests so that we are still subsidizing fossil fuels by hundreds and hundreds of billions. Unfortunately, there is this kind of vulgar market fundamentalism which says that the market solution is always perfect. And they don't, in a way, take into account that there are external externalities. And you must be stupid not to understand that these external externalities require some official action in order to get by taxes or subsidies or some way then a compensation for these externalities. But that's not always understood, certainly not in the... American uh, Republican circles, which are fighting hard against uh, um, environmental policy. There is a lack of awareness. There is always an uncertainty. There are always people who say, we don't know for sure. And that, uh, so then you, you can propagate conspiracy theories or anyway, so doubt. There is the need for international agreement because in a way, why should we do in Finland? We are a tiny fraction of a percent in, in our uh, uh, emissions. So we would need the United States, China and the European Union to form a common front. They could then push the rest of the countries uh, by using carrots and sticks like carbon uh, tax, uh, border taxes or, or things like that. And they could um, also use carrots by uh, promising technological help to, to poor countries in order to, uh, to simplify. We would need coordination with, let's say, the American Inflation Reduction Act and what we want to do in Europe. Now it's a little bit messy because we are not uh, on the same, same track. There are some, I believe, misguided views on the trade-off that I always keep meeting 
uh, young people, be they my own ancestors or not, but who, who think that that um, uh, that the only solution is uh, degrowth, and uh, well, I don't happen to believe that, but they believe it very strongly in a way that we have sinned against nature, we are on the wrong path, and we will end up in hell with an unhibitable globe. So we can't live on that, and we should improve our manners and be very accepting, hard discipline, and then in the end we might be rescued. Uh, I, I think that is an kind of a, 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 a analogy to the, to the Bible there. But be that as it may, then you have the populists who say in Finland, for instance, and in Sweden as well, that we can't afford to pay the price. The trade-off is too too bad. So somebody else should probably pick up the price, which is not a very helpful. And then what I think is almost the biggest problem of all, that we need compensatory policies. We need to help the poor countries in a way to, to manage this, because they are now the big emitters, but they are not, cumulatively speaking, have not been. So we need to help, much more international help to the poor countries, and we need domestically also to help those people who, who suffer the consequences of this. So there is a lot of economic, social, political problems, uh, which explain why, unfortunately, we are still waiting for the re-election. I believe that this problem is solvable, and I believe it will be solved, but unfortunately we ain't there yet, because the pressure is not strong enough. And the question is, will there be strong enough pressure before it's too late, in a way? And, and that, I think, is, we don't have an answer to that question. Yes, thank you. OT would like, would you like to com comment on this? Yeah, maybe to add, like, from a point of view of Policymaker, I think one issue with this uh, carbon dividend uh, plan or policy is that, first of all, if it's efficient and it would actually reduce emissions, at some point, of course, you know, this luxurious of having a tax which brings more money to the uh, government coffin will actually end. And of course, it's definitely not like in Finland, it would not be in 10 years' time. But somehow, I think they feel it's a threat to, to put a policy in place that is not going to work forever. I don't think, yeah, I, I struggle to understand that, uh, but I think that's one issue why the politicians are not too keen on this. And the second is that maybe, you know, if you would uh, increase, let's say, taxes on petrol, citizens will notice that when they go to, you know, gas station, they will notice that it actually the price has been increased. Whereas if they're... Uh, tax, uh, you know, labor tax has been reduced a bit. You know, some might notice it, but not necessarily others. You know, you look your pay slip like once a month, not like maybe once a week when you go and, and uh, uh, see the price on pe petrol. So there's definitely this, uh, maybe some imbalance between like how people see the, the, be the cost and benefits. They might really see the cost, but the benefits might be diluted a bit. Yeah. I mean, no, nobody says it's going to be easy, yeah. right? If you restrict attention to solutions that people already like, then we'll, or, you know, we won't find anything that works at all. I think the lump sum payment might help. Yeah. So the proposal, the U.S. proposal that I mentioned is that you tax the people who pollute, and then you take the money, you divide it up among the population, and then you send uh, cash to everyone, every citizen or every resident or something every month. I think that would be psychologically more salient than having like a negative income tax kind of solution because you'd get a, a deposit every month. Like I have children where I live, I get a small amount of money from the government every month as you know child yeah. support. It's not enough to make a difference to my life, uh, really, but it still feels good to get a, a chunk of money in my account every month. And the thought is to have a similar deposit, like here's your climate deposit. Um, if you're relatively affluent, it's not actually going to make a big difference to your life, but it's still going to feel good. But if you're poor, it might actually make a real difference. And moreover, of course, it's implicit here that if your carbon footprint is low, if you don't eat too much meat, you don't fly too much, you don't drive everywhere, then you're going to come out ahead. So at the end of the month, you'll make money. The people who are going to pay the cost are the people with a very high carbon footprint. But maybe that's not unjust, right? Because they're the people responsible for, for the problem. And actually, that it's been implemented in Canada. They do have this tax and 
you know, the return on, on citizens. I think there's income threshold, so the most well-off uh, citizens won't get the payment, but uh, kind of other, others do. Yeah, I think the point is that this is workable. Mm. Like the problem is something else. And as Sixten mentioned, where I live, the government is moving in the opposite direction. So the argument is we can't afford, yeah, sure, climate change is a problem, but we can't afford to do anything about it in the middle of an economic crisis. Right? Solving the problem is a luxury thing. We'll do it like later when the economic crisis is over. But of course, if we keep thinking like that, the crises are going to get worse and worse, right? Um, and there's never going to be a time when we feel like we can afford to do something about it. I think there has been some criticism towards environmental economists that the, the only solutions they've been providing is, is, is a carbon tax and not necessarily looking kind of broader. <laughs> Maybe I ag agree to that criticism a little bit, that, you know, as it has not been implemented widely, we should still uh, try, of course, but maybe definitely look at other solutions as well. And for example, in Finland, we have this uh, law to phase out coal by 2029. And when it was introduced, there was a lot of criticism from the businesses and uh, private sector that it's going to be very expensive. And uh, yeah, this kind of regulation, you just, um, you have some plants that will still be operational and then you just have to uh, get, get rid of that. It's not cost efficient. But the government went on and actually implemented the law. And now what happened actually businesses are going to get rid of coal before the deadline. So they just, even they said that it's going to be impossible, it isn't. And actually they are getting rid of it earlier than the deadline. So I think we also even, definitely it's not a cost efficient, the most cost efficient way, but I think we have to go beyond these cost efficient the first. My, yeah, sorry. Yeah, just go on. My sense is that corporations say that a lot. So there have been various reforms over, I guess, my yeah. lifetime seatbelt law, uh, laws mandating seatbelts in cars, mandating catalytic converters and whatnot. And every time there's some corporation that says, this is going to kill the industry, we're never going to make money if we have to put catalytic converters in our cars. And then the law takes effect, they put the uh, equipment in, and it's fine, right? Um, yeah, how to have brave enough politicians, that's one, right. one question. Maybe I should just add that, I mean, to some extent, I think economists brought this problem upon themselves, because although the profession as a whole is overwhelmingly lined up behind the proposal that we've been discussing, I mean, there have been specific individuals who haven't exactly covered themselves in glory. And I think it's not unreasonable for a non-economist to look at them and make inferences about the profession as a whole. Like I feel like people's reactions to economists are often shaped by a small number of, of people who are definite outliers. And so we could do a better job of like explaining what, what the profession thinks as a whole, as opposed to the specific individuals. But we're terrible at PR, right? The uh, economic profession is just awful at media. And maybe that's something we should work on. Yes, thank you. I think that the, the climate crisis also clearly opens up the discussion about the economics discipline, about the plurality of uh, approaches, which may challenge also the mainstream market-based solutions to climate change. And the, it opens up the question of possibility of integrating ecological thinking into economics. Right? But I think uh, we can come back to this question when we are talking about the future of economics, whether it actually has to transform itself or open up to other ways of thinking in order to tackle challenges. So we can come back to that. But I think it seems that we are here discussing mostly the, mostly the market-based solutions, but there are many, many other uh, proposals pretty radical out there. And I think this is also part of the conversation about economics, how to assess them. Sixton is skeptical about the growth, but there are circular economy ideas, which are actually popular in Finland. Finnish government is at least was trying to implement them. So I think it's worth keeping it in mind that when we think about climate change, that's actually one of these rare occasions when there are alternatives, frameworks that out are there and they're actually treated seriously as an alternative to the to the mainstream market-based solutions to whatever uh, societal or economic challenges are there. I just would like to leave it there and I think we, we will have a chance to really come back to that question, the, the reflection on the state of economics uh, a little bit later. 
And I think now we can move to the topics of poverty, which is actually linked to climate change, as we, some of us already alluded. Uh, poor people are likely to be more affected by the climate change, which leads to unfairness, given that poor people globally have contributed least to the problem, right? That's the established, I think, uh, concern of many people who discuss these issues. So let's ask ourselves whether has economics anything to offer to alleviate poverty? And sh when thinking about this question, shall we start actually first from providing explanations of the main causes of poverty before we move on to propose solutions, such as cash transfers, policies stimulating economic growth, or publicly provided capital like education or minimum wage regulation. That's also one of the policy that is con conceived as a way of uh, tackling poverty. So, shall we start from understanding the poverty causes and uh, does economic have anything to contribute here before we come up with solutions to how to go about it? And I will ask uh, Mina. Yes. first uh, to, to tell us a little bit about that because she has also worked and thought a lot about this, uh, these questions in her research. Yeah, um, the part in the book relating to poverty I think was perhaps a little bit um, superficial would be a wrong word, it, it's, it's going quite deep but um, I wasn't quite sure whether you were talking about poverty in developing countries or developed countries or overall poverty and how to, to relieve poverty because poverty in developing countries is something really different than in develop, developed countries like in, in Nordic welfare states which you don't mention actually even once in your book Nordic welfare states uh, which is quite interesting uh, a choice um, also that you don't refer to the political contexts or um, contexts where the, the decisions are made. But I think we understand where the poverty comes from, why people are poor. We have a pre pretty good understanding actually why, why people are poor. They don't have work or they don't have education or, or either and they are not able to provide for themselves. And um, in, in the world where you need to work in order to get money. Then there's this other world where everybody gets basic income and uh, that's an interesting world. What would that world be like? Is it feasible or not? There would be no poverty but um, it would have very many different kind of social economical effects to change the whole kind of system of markets and I think their economists would have a lot to say and I, it's interesting that you don't mention basic income as a concept in your book even once, you talk about it. And you talk about the experiments in Kenya, for example. I think that was actually a basic income experiment, if I recall right. And I think it's still going on. It, I think it was a 12 years long experiment. It's really interesting what kind of um, results they're going to get. But um, you don't mention basic income. Why? It's a, I just want to know. Um, but it's, I think where you should in the book hold answers for poverty is actually the part which I was most uh, delighted was the social norms part where you build the social norms about about educational levels for example why should we educate everybody for example Nordic welfare states why should we offer a free education to everybody what's behind it do we want to relieve poverty do we want that people are actually not poor and I think that's we need the economists, but I think we also need the social planners, which is actually also part of economics. You need those who plan and design these welfare states. But of course, economists are a big part of it. Um, poverty is a very wicked problem. And when you read the whole book, you kind of get an idea of what the economics can offer. But then I'm, I'm working very close to political decision making and, and I can understand why things are not very easy to implement like carbon tax. If, if I want something to happen um, 
for example, in four or eight years, depends on whether I want to ha it happen to national level or, or in EU level, I have to start now. And it may happen in 10 or 20 In EU, it may take in 15, 20 years to get a solution to some wicked problem. And poverty, I think it, it can never be solved. But, um, um, yeah, what I really liked um, in the part of poverty is uh, that you discuss the bandwidth and the idea of, of uh, financial stress. And, and I think where economists could actually provide more is, is the idea of financial stress, which we actually, an, an economist a friend of mine, studied uh, in, in the evaluation study of um, basic income. She studied financial stress. And I think there, economists could actually be very much of value to, to discuss more about what happens when there is not enough money. You mentioned a couple of economists who've done that, um, but um, I think there could be more research on that because that actually links to the climate change and the need to think again about work, what happens when there's much more robotization, automation, what happens when we all have chat GPT or what happens to work, for example. So this is a huge, and I think you, you could have actually the part two and three to your, your book series, because I think you just grasped the very simple ones. And I think this is not just for the big audience on the streets, the book. I think it, it, you can offer us also a much to economists to think a, a little bit different and be more humble. Than this. I think this is, I've, I've worked with economists who I, I could say look down to me because I'm a social politician. I want to look at the world in a qualitative way. And it's like, qualitative? No way. It, it's, it's just... Uh, and it, it's, we have to find each other, in, for example, in climate crisis. It's just uh, what we have to do. Thank you. Do you have a quick reaction, Eric? Sure. Yeah. So uh, when it comes to explaining the causes of poverty, I'm somewhat partial to the view that poverty is not the thing that needs explaining. So over the course of the times that humans have existed, like poverty is the normal state, right? The vast mm -hmm. majority of people have been poor. Um, uh, we belong to a very tiny fraction of humanity, right? Who are this spectacularly rich. Um, but you can ask, of course, oh, so the point is that what needs explaining is the riches, right? How come some people got so fantastically mm -hmm. rich when almost everybody else throughout history have been so poor? But you can ask more specific questions, like, for example, why are there very poor people in otherwise extremely rich places, right? And uh, why is poverty persistent? Why does it persist not just over a person's lifetime, but sometimes over multiple generations? I mean, these, seems good, seem, these seem like good questions, and they're questions that economists have, have addressed. But then there's also the question about what to do about it. And you don't always need to know what the causes of the problem was in order to figure out what to do about it. Uh, what I focus on in that chapter is sort of political rhetoric about poverty that's very often focused on making poor people's lives harder, right? So much political rhetoric suggests that poor people are lazy, they don't work hard enough, they need to be incentivized to work, right? We need to give them less money, we have to make their lives as poor people, as unemployed people, even more miserable mm -hmm. than they already um, are. And um, I'm pointing to research that suggests that Poverty is so persistent in part because this feeling of scarcity interferes with your ability to make rational decisions, the sort of decisions that could allow you to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And if you then, by means of policy, make these people's lives even harder, you're going to interfere even more with their ability to do what they already know they need to do. And so, so much economic, contemporary economic research, stuff coming out of behavioral economics, suggests rather that what we need to do is to make poor people's lives easier. We need to give them cash, uh, uh, you know, basic income if you like, or like unconditional cash transfers, so they can deal with the most urgent, desperate problems. And then we need to, in some cases, just make their lives easier. So childcare, I think, is a good example. 
if you're a single mother, for example, having childcare is absolutely critical for being able to join the workforce. And yet, in so many places where it's provided by the market, it's outrageously expensive. Uh, it might be a poor quality. It might take a lot of work trying to find a decent daycare for your, for your child. And then providing daycare uh, for single mothers may be just the ticket, right? But that's the complete opposite of what so much political rhetoric suggests. And it might be, you know, just interesting to know that economists are overwhelmingly on the side of making poor people's lives easier rather than harder. If I can comment very briefly on, I think the this example shows very clearly that the narrative about which blames poor people for their condition actually comes also from classical, no classical theories of poverty and only behavioral economists come with counter narratives to that. So I think this example shows that when we ask ourselves whether economics can be helpful in even conceptualizing the problem at hand, it matters which economics sometimes, right? So I think we, we need this qualification. So we can't really answer probably this question at this general level. So it's not only conservative politicians who have this narrative about poor people, there actually is economic, other economic theories which contributed to that. Just a, just yeah. a addition, and I would like to give a floor to Sixten because I think he has yeah, a I think that uh, the issue of why there is poverty is interesting and a relevant question before we go to the medicine that, uh, and uh, I would say that it's even the most important question in social sciences. Why was it that in Northern Europe and in the United States a few hundred years ago, the great enrichment started so that we have this fabulous development that we have not seen otherwise? The Bible tells, uh, tells us that there will always be poor people with us, but, and we certainly have poor people with us, but still there's happened something enormous. And I would say that, as I understand it, uh, uh, modern economics argues that the explanation is pretty much to be found in institutions, which is a little bit too superficial answer, but I'm thinking, for instance, of the book by Darren Asamoglu and James Robinson, Why Nations Fail. Uh, which rather convincingly explains why things are lousy in Russia while they are great in Finland. And I think that it's true that the difference is in uh, institutions, even though one has to go beyond institutions mm -hmm. and say that that's true only if the institutions are backed up by culture. And that's not the case in Russia. They do superficially, they have the institutions, in reality they don't. While we have, and then there is a for instance, a trilogue by Deidre McCloskey, who's uh, 2,000 pages. I mean, I couldn't read all the three of them, but <laughs> her thesis is very simple that it was culture. It was the, the uh, bourgeois mentality in starting in the 16th or 17th century, which paved the way for liberalism, which paved the way for all of this, which we're now enjoying. I don't think this, uh, this is not an argument on what you say. I'm sure that giving cash to poor people is a good idea. I, I, I follow your reasoning and I think it's right. But I guess you are talking now about really poor countries. Uh, because I don't think this is the answer if we go to, say, the Nordic countries or Western Europe countries. I think poverty here is, uh, is, a, much, is a different problem, as I think uh, Minna was saying, that absolute poverty is one thing. It could be eliminated, by the way, in the world if the rich countries decided that it be done. It has already been reduced enormously over the past decades. Now it's not falling anymore, but it could be reduced. But to solve the problem of poverty in our welfare states is almost impossible in a way because we are talking about relative poverty, and that's in many ways tricky. But at least in the Nordic countries, we are not doing bad. I think Minna was referring, uh, referring to the Nordics, perhaps, and I also, at some stage, I would like to raise the question, but not necessarily for this debate, but I'm struck by the fact that whenever you look at international comparisons, we Nordics do well. And say, for instance, this uh, uh, international happiness report, I don't like the word, uh, but uh, Anyway, it has come out now six years in a row, and every time the five Nordics have been among the top ten, about 150 countries. I think it's interesting. There's something which we are doing right, obviously, here in the, in the, in the Nordic countries. But uh, my point was only to say that I, I think your medicine is right, but I think it could also be 
uh, enlarged a little bit in the direction of saying that we also need a little bit investment in infrastructure, uh, above all, try institutions building and education above, above all. That. I, I think those I would just add. Mina, before, 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 before Eric comments, please, yeah, Mina. Yeah, um, and just going a little bit behind yes. the institutions, which um, Sixta referred to, and, and I, I think I just try to capture the Nordic welfare state, to, um, even if it's not um, mentioned even in your book, but um, trying to understand why we've managed so well, and I think it's not just because of economists, even I think one, or couple of the most best thinkers in the 60s, 70s, who built this, or the Nordic welfare states were economists. But when I think of, um, uh, I don't usually think so much of myself, but now I think. When I read the book, I started to think of uh, how I, I grew up in Finland. I was born in 75, and I, I'm, I re represent um, the age cohort that has the best education in Finland, the best, those who were born in 75. And when I Tried, I tried to remember, um, I didn't come a wealthy family, we didn't have much money, and I've always thought that it, they were my parents who wanted me to educate myself, but actually it wasn't. It was the welfare, the social norm in the welfare state. It was something in the air. It was the mother and father, like I think in Sweden, they think that the Folkhemmet, they are the father. The state is the father and the mother who wants everybody to study to make the best of themselves. It, it wasn't my, my mother or father, they were very low educated. They didn't know anything about education, but still I've educated because it was an expectation in the society. It was something, uh, I don't know what it is. It's, and I think we don't have that anymore. It's not because of economists even, <laughs> there could be some reason too. Um, but I think what we need when we do these great social plans and, and and establish social norms. We need the economists, but we need also other scientists. Uh, but above all, I think we need the very curious minds, intelligent people who want to, who want to make things better and not just um, look at the theories and, and data. Uh, that's important too, but you have to come above it. So, yeah. Oh, would you please? Just a brief comment. I I think here is, it's again about the, the title, how to eliminate, eliminate poverty. It's a, it's a big title and uh, mm. cash transfers definitely are part of it, but I think they more answer the question like if, you know, how to build up safety nets and then like, you know, if you have uh, the safety nets, it's better to often, on average, it's better to give the money than let's say flour or, or rice or something tangible. And um, as Sixten already mentioned, even economists have, have studied poverty very extensively, and there are institutions, there is education, there is health, um, corruption related to institutions. So, uh, and then not to mention other, other disciplines. So I think it's, it's more about the framing the question. There's definitely uh, uh, cash transfers play a role, and I agree, like, you know, um, if you give uh, aid, you know, on average, it's best to give it uh, as, as, as money. But then, for example, in a fragile state where the markets won't work, when, you know, there's nothing in the shop, it doesn't really help to have the money. So the local conditions that you mentioned again, I think it's very important also in this chapter. Yeah. Sorry. So, so poverty uh, is obviously one of those topics where there's a ton that has been left out, right? We've been at it for 250 years already, right? Adam Smith was on about this, and so I had to make very harsh decisions about what to include and what not to include. I wanted to talk about the benefits of cash transfers, which have been tested in like randomized control trials and so on, and which seem to work well, um, and they have unexpected effects on like mental health and, and things, in part to signal that there are things that can be done about stuff. So poverty might seem like one of these problems that are just intractable, right? It's been with us since forever. Some people have tried, they've failed. Um, 
you might draw the conclusion that it's all hopeless. And as a sort of Gen X person myself, you know, I get it, right? I'm fluent in cynicism and so on. But then I talk to my students, and um, they're obviously an entirely different generation. And they tell me that they're sometimes tired of hearing about problems. Right? They, they know climate change is a massive problem. They don't need like scientists, old people like myself to tell them it's a big problem. They more, so much more often want to hear like, what is there to be done about it? And I think what's going on here is that like in my lifetime, there was real discussion about whether climate change was real and to what extent it was driven by human um, activity and so on. And so many of us are still in that mindset where we feel like we have to argue that it is a problem. Like, uh, you don't get it. There is a problem. You see so many articles and op-ed pieces just like trying to drive home the point that there's a problem. But there's another generation out there now that gets it. They've lived with this their entire lives and they want to know, like, what can we do about it? Like, what are the ways forward? And in the case of climate change, as we said, there is a proposal that we could implement. In the case of, of poverty reduction, there are things we can do. We can like, give them cash, right? There's enough cash to go around that we can give poor people some, right? And lift them out of the most desperate level of, of poverty. And so I wanted to highlight that in service of the, the optimism, I, I guess. And there are big questions. Um, it's a complex problem. And yet, here's something that we can do that's relatively simple and relatively cheap, frankly. Mina, just a mm -hmm. short comment or question. Um, you talk about your grandmother, that she was very low educated, but she wanted to know more. She was poor and couldn't get out of poverty, but she wanted to learn. And I think what I s you don't return to education. The role of e education, is, is, I think, is missing in the book. Even you talk about your grandma, and I think she wanted to be more educated. So what is... Why did you leave education away? Because it's, it's, I think it's the most powerful, powerful thing to get. You don't just give money to people, but at the same time you have to empower them, you have to give, give them tools to... You talk about the tools, and you talk about the empowerment, but not so much about education. Yeah, education could have been a whole chapter, right? Yeah, the economics could. of whole education <laughs> as a vibrant yeah. discipline. Uh, I'm already toying with like many perfectionists are unable to leave good enough alone, right? So I'm already thinking about what I should have done. Instead, I'm also kicking myself. There's not a chapter on gender, right? It would have been so, I mean, it would have been so easy to have a chapter on gender, and I cannot believe I did not include one. But if there's a second edition, I'll if, think about yeah. education as well. Gender is definitely going in. Right, so let's look into the future. Let's ask ourselves whether we share Eric's optimism about economics and mainstream economics in particular, or not, although you are not only optimist about the profession, you, you, you mentioned that. So is economics as a discipline as it is right now up to the task of providing some constructive solutions to important societal problems or even economic problems? Does it have to change? What has to change? How do we envision uh, its future? And we can go wild, <laughs> because that's the question about vision and, and what, uh, how it could look. But uh, of course, if we have more, much more concrete proposals where how we could get that, that would be useful too. So I will maybe start from six then this time. Okay, I think we could be optimistic. I do think that economics has established itself as uh, the strongest social science, I would argue. And I think that a little bit differently from what you said in the introduction, that generally speaking, uh, economists are listened to and, and respected, perhaps excessively in this country. And I share a little bit your... Uh, cynical comments about uh, these guys who are not really scientists in the academia and come in front of the television and, and offer you a sermon like priests. And I think it's, it's true and I'm, I can say something about it because I've often been the priest in, in front of the media. So I know what it is about and it's a, it's a problem. I think that I would be very happy to see we have so well-educated, brilliant economists in the academia. Mm -hmm. They are too little out, out there talking to people. So that's a pity. But there are a few, uh, a few things which may make me uh, reservations, even though my general tenor is optimism. One is you often refer uh, or compare economics to medicine. 
And I understand it in the sense that both try to improve the patient or society and both are suffering from uncertainty and both can sometimes use randomized experiments, similar methodologies. John Maynard Keynes, in fact, once wrote that he looks forward to the future when an economist will be like a dentist. Rather boring job, but good for the patient. And unfortunately, I don't think we're quite there yet. And the problem is that we can't always organize uh, randomized experiments in economics. It's often, very often the case that you can't define the counterfactual and that leaves then ample scope for uh, other factors to come into the calculation. So that I would argue that very often, and this is particularly true in macroeconomics, that very often uh, you don't have the counterfactual and therefore uh, the way that you, the question you ask, the way you define the problem, and also the answers are very strongly colored by your pre-analytic vision, to use the words of jo Joseph Schumpeter. And that gives ideology a lot of, 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 of room. And uh, I don't think one can do too much about it, but it's, it's a difficulty which we have to keep in mind and therefore be concerned about what kind of ideological uh, uh, th things we have in our mind. As I said, I think this is particularly true of macroeconomics. You can't do controlled experiments in macroeconomics. And I would say that I think that the main problem of economics, as I see it, is macroeconomics. Because 10 years ago, in the consequence of the global financial crisis, orthodox economics on the macroeconomic side was declared dead. But nothing new has really emerged. And the problem with macroeconomics has always been that, that the only link between the financial system and the real economic development is one interest rate. And that's not very rich uh, characterization of the issue. And it's very difficult to deal with all these self-reinforcing forces which destabilize the financial system uh, every now and then. So it's a problem. I don't know what one should do about it. I, maybe a lot has happened because I don't follow the latest developments in the science. I can't argue that. So I do like Paul Krugman does. I fall back on old-fashioned, simple-minded Keynesian macroeconomics, and I think it's a, a great help. There are useful lessons still to be applied by, by relying on, on, on those simple models. Anyway, that's on one area which is difficult. The second, which you are very much, I think, uh, enhancing is that interdisciplinary approaches, yes, are very helpful. And I would myself uh, add not only psychology and sociology, but also would say that uh, humanistic sciences, uh, philosophy, indeed, certainly, and history, things like these, I think, can be very helpful for broadening your understanding of society to get a bet bet better evaluation of the big picture, to understand the role of cultural factors. Because it is a bit stupid of economists sometimes in the Chicago tradition, Gary Becker and these people who say that the model that they sketch is true always everywhere, because all human beings are rational and their behavior is dictated by incentives, and that's all there is to it, plus budget constraints, and that's simply not true. There's a lot of divergence to local conditions, as you referred to earlier, I agree very much on that, and I think you are doing indeed a service in broadening the scope and, and uh, making us enter into these uh, neighbor sciences, and I, I hope that will the, be one of the avenues for, for the future of economics. Thank you, Auti. Yeah, let's collect, let's collect ideas and then... Uh, yeah, um, I think when you part. think about the future of economics, you have to both think about the internal issues and then the external, mm -hmm. such as uh, inter interdisciplinary uh, approaches. And when we think about the, the internal issues, we need to think about and discuss gender and also other, other um, minorities is still a major problem. When I studied in the University of Helsinki years back, there was one uh, female professor and now I look at the list, there is none. Uh, so it's, it's a massive problem here, uh, but also uh, globally. And if I, I do you think it affects what type of uh, research is doing? And of course, when it's uh, very imbalanced, then you know if you're um, the the person who is reading your paper, evaluating it, if he's not interested in that paper, it just we know from research that it affects the the ability to to, uh, to evaluate it. So it's it's a massive issue, and we should do something about it. And then uh, the external issue. 
I agree with uh, what Sixten said that, yeah, this um, interaction with other, other sciences, I think if you want to serve the society, none of the problems we have can be solved by economics alone. So it's, it's very important. And I would list, you have a great list already, but I would add there biology and e ecology. If there are any uh, economic students out there, there's a massive need at the moment for economists who understand ecology, biology, and vice versa. So, so please, uh, um, if there is opportunity to expand your, uh, your studies, do that. So, in, yeah. That's for me. Thank you, Mina. Would you would like to add something? Or yes, not yes, please. <laughs> yeah. um, future. I'm optimistic also about the future. We have uh, great minds, and, and I think we can um, solve the problems that are coming. At least I hope so. Um, I was fascinated about the um, overconfidence, underconfidence part of the book. And, and when you referred to Sledgehammer, I, I just had to look at it. I, I found the first episode on YouTube, and I had to look because I'm a fan of Sledgehammer. But I had totally forgotten um, Dory Doro, the female police officer. Um, like the gender question, the internal question, um, she refused um, a promotion in the very first episode because she wanted not to be better than the sledgehammer. And I think that's a very interesting question about women economists. Uh, why aren't they not as recognized or as much on stage as, as male economists? Um, I don't know, it, it's... They're not all. I know very nice economists who are not so uh, overconfident, but when we had 2018, we uh, implemented an activation model in Finland as part of um, unemployment security system, employment benefit system. It was quite, um, well, an interesting, it wasn't an experiment, although it was, um, then after a couple of years, it was um, abolished. But I discussed with some of the economists I really appreciate, and they said they had to believe in it because in theory it should work. And I was what theory? It's a social theory, it's a theory about uh, society, it's not nothing can, that comes from nature. And I think that's a, a bit of a problem in economics, I don't know if there's external, internal problem, that you don't kind of, or economists uh, as being one of them too, don't think that it's, it's social sciences, it's something almost natural sciences, and it's not, it's not even close to there, and it should be kept in mind because the choices made uh, concerning the theories are just choices between many theories, and what's taught at the universities is very much a neoclassical way of teaching economics, and it makes some people really overconfident about their skills, and they then we come to the fact that you have to I don't like the idea that we have to, to come out of the university if there are students in four or five years. I'm really allergic to all these um, times, kind of, um, I don't know the word in English now, but um, you have to stroll over the university, you have to experiment the university, you have to widen your perspective and study everything, because I think the Nordic welfare state is not about economics, it's not about social sciences, it's about great minds that have actually been in the university 10 or 20 years. Elinor Ostrom was actually not economist. I had she looked, and she was so a political scientist. She was not accepted into the economist uh, PhD program, because she didn't have enough mathematics in her um, curriculum in the high school. So she was, she did her PhD in political sciences, but she gets a economic Nobel, um, Nobel in economics, and I really, I, I love Ostrom, I've read a couple of her books, but I, I think I've made my point. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Eric. Well, I'm, I'm struggling to make this point in a suitably humble sort of way, but I think one of the reasons to be optimistic about the prospects of economics is that there are so many other people out there who suck so bad at their jobs. So I think the, epidem the pandemic really brought this point, point home. And so there were so many epidemiologists on television who said something like, um, the disease is very bad, and so consequently we have to 
X lockdown or closed schools or whatever, um, where they completely skirted the step in the middle, which is the cost benefit analysis, right? There are benefits and costs to any intervention. What are the costs? What are the benefits? How are they distributed? Like, how are we to assess those things against each other? Um, another example, so um, my mother being in her 80s got invited earlier to get a vaccine in Stockholm where she lives. And in order to book an appointment, she had to get her phone and she had to download three separate apps. She had to copy and paste a code, a complicated code from one app to the other. She had to have a password and a username. And it was so complicated that not only could she not do it herself, but I could not walk her through the steps on the phone. I was like, download the app, what's an app? Where do I find the app? Well, go to the app store, what's an app store? Mm -hmm. So I had to physically go to her house and like do it for her. This system was obviously designed by somebody in IT, right? Not a behavioral scientist, probably within 100 yards. And then you got a little uh, corona test in the drugstore and you got looked at the instructional booklet and the instructional booklet was this large, written in four point font, very obviously formulated by lawyers, right? Being defensive about getting sued about things. The instructions were barely readable to me in my 50s and somebody much older would be less, even less likely to, to be able to read it, right? And so these are like three contexts where because the people who design the system that we have to navigate are so bad at their jobs, an economist could do a real positive difference, even if economics is in many ways like horribly flawed. And it really is. Like the discipline could be improved in all sorts of ways, some of which I, I mentioned. The profession has got awful in all sorts of ways. Like there's persi persistent discrimination every step along the way of the profession is insufficiently diverse. There are all sorts of institutional pressures that push in the wrong direction. Um, and the education, um, the way we teach economics could be improved in all sorts of ways. So economics as it's actually practiced by real researchers, I think is, is super exciting, but the way we teach it often seems to lag uh, by 30 years or something. You still very often start with this, this case of the ideal competitive market and um, the interesting wrinkles like asymmetric information and whatever, you might not get to until like two, three, four years into your studies. It would be possible to turn that upside down, start with the exciting stuff and then teach the rest as like special cases. And so there are lots of things that, that can be done to improve economics, to improve the profession, to improve the way we, we teach it. Uh, but all that said, right, you can say that while still insisting that even the thing that we have, flawed as it is, is like massively useful in all sorts of contexts. Thank you. And I think now it's time for opening the floor for questions from audience as well as questions from the from the chat there's one question please uh, yeah, yes it's coming it's coming uh, so um uh, my name is Anni Norring I work as a senior economist at the Central Bank of Finland so I'm a macroeconomist so the worst of the lot I think <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for a very interesting and and thought provoking uh, uh talk uh, I found this very, very fascinating. And this point of view of finding ways of how to efficiently make the world a better place with economics, it made me uh, think about all the global problems that are in need of global solutions and uh, multilateralism. So that's international cooperation across the whole uh, global community. That's what I mainly work with uh, in, my, in my work in the IMF context. And to me, it seems that these international institutions that we have, so the UN, uh, all the multi multilateral development banks, the World Bank, the IMF and all the rest, they, uh, they can or at least they should play a very crucial role in, in facilitating the implementation of, of all the insights that economics uh, can, can bring us to make us and the, and the planet uh, well off. But then what worries me at the moment is, is what's going on outside uh, economics, specifically in politics, in geopolitics, uh, in that sphere, that has given rise to this threat of uh, fragmentation of the global economy. Uh, into competing blocks 
and also of the global community fragmenting into these different blocks that have then difficulty to work together. And if that is something that we allow to happen, then of course these global solutions, they will be, uh, they will be uh, much more difficult to find. And, uh, and as basically always, the ones that will bear the cost of, of these developments, they will be the most vulnerable households and countries. And that would be very unfortunate. So, so my question to, to all of the panel would be, um, what's your take on how we could uh, counteract these trends uh, driving us towards this type of fragmentation and what role economics uh, could play in this? Thank you. I want to answer that. <laughs> Do you want to start? No, you can. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah, a, a super, super important point. And as we talk, like uh, globalization and the in, uh, international institutions are kind of uh, uh, lacking. And uh, we understand because, yeah, you have to put some, uh, some limits uh, on the pages. Um, we know that these global uh, issues such as uh, biodiversity loss, climate change, poverty, <laughs> would be uh, much easier to solve if we had a, a, a global system built on, on, on trust and maybe that trust is at the moment uh, a very scarce resource. Um, I think uh, still there's some hope. I just refer to the Montreal Kunming framework, um, the new biodiversity framework, which was agreed in Montreal in December, to, uh, last December. And against all odds, it was a better outcome that we expected. So countries were still able to come together and agree on a framework uh, on a very difficult global situation. And some might argue that because of this global uh, situation, maybe they felt the urgency to, to tr try to, to find a, a solution. And when it comes to um, economics, what uh, role economics could play, in, uh, in the system, um, I think one is the kind of this the thought of being humble, and I think if we want to really work on a global system and uh, with, uh, with uh, also the global south, I think this us being more humble is, is a prerequisite the, this when it comes to trade agreements. Um, exploitation of natural resources, name it. I think the system needs to change that we understand that we need to be the one who is, who is a bit more humble in, this, in these agreements. Well, I could add a, a little bit. First of all, I mean, economists always had this optimistic view that free trade would uh, enhance uh, peace. In fact, in the 18th century, Montesquieu wrote about it, David Hume and others, and they were very optimistic that once you get free trade, then you have mutual interest between the participating countries, and everybody will understand that it's not in your interest to destroy the trading relationships. And that is part of the basis on which uh, the post-war Bretton Woods regime was, was built, but now it has broken down, partly because of the war in Ukraine and partly because of the conflict between uh, United States and, and China, and that's a great pity. At the same time, it does demonstrate that there was something to this theory. We are suffering from the fact that we get this fragmentation, not only in terms of loss of economic efficiency, but also in terms of the, in terms of the political polarization, which in the end can endanger world peace. So, so it's, it's certainly an important issue. Uh, what can you do about it? I mean, the, basically, you have this problem that the world is like a, a small village, and we are highly interdependent, and you need some system for, for managing this, but we don't have it, because we have uh, nation states, and, and uh, that's the institution which is the strongest and has the best, uh, in a way, legitimacy in the world, is the nation state. But the nation state, by definition, cannot solve the problems at the global level if you can't achieve a sufficiently good cooperation. And here comes in the national populism. 
which has grown so strong, partly because of the failure of the capitalist system, because it has spelled disaster, and that disaster, in my view, has created the, the basis for this kind of populism, which now wants to strengthen national sovereignty and is making it even more difficult to achieve the international agreements that we do need. What can be done? I don't know, but I would hope that if you could achieve, as I said earlier, some sort of understanding between China, United States and the European Union on that basis, then G7, G20, I don't believe that these formal organizations, be it IMF or World Bank, they are doing a decent job, each one of them in their own field, but I think that these informal organizations are those who could hopefully at some stage uh, engineer and, and improvement in glo global, global cooperation, but for the time being, it's very difficult to be optimistic on this front, yeah. Further thoughts? Mina? Yeah, when it, yeah, when it comes to these um, multinational organizations, and, and I would say European Union is the most important to us. Um, I, a couple of months ago, I, I was able to participate in a platform about labor migration. And enthusiast commissars were telling how we need more labor migration from, from third countries, that we need common um, ethical and other, other rules for how we are trying to kind of bring workforce from third countries to European Union. And most delegates were kind of smiling and, and thinking that it, this is really good. And then there were two hands raised up from Hungary, of course, they had some remarks to the paper, and Sweden. And I think this is, um, we really try, uh, for example, European Union, ILO, UN, we try to make things better, but it's not easy when there are always, because we have to be kind of united in, our, in, in the way we try to proceed with, with these good things. And we tend to have I I've not, don't know if you've ever had that kind of Europe where we have all kind of, how would I say, sane leaders who are um, in the opinion that it's good to educate people, it's good to be a civilized society. But I think if we keep in mind that we need, what we need here is high education, um, we need to kind of hang on to the idea of civilized society. And if we can keep that message strong in these international communities, I think that's what we can do. But unfortunately, we can't change the leaders in, in every country, even if that would be good. That's unfortunate, because then it means that if one country is against something in the European Union, then it probably it takes 15 or 20 years to get it. We're already thinking we have now Sweden as a... Um, um, leading the European Union. Um, chairman. Yeah, chairman. And then we're going to have Spain and Belgium. Really nice. After that, Hungary and Poland. It's going to be interesting. But that's what we have to think, because when we start changing things, it takes in the European Union 10 to 15 years. You have a question? Yes, I saw it. I saw there was a question here, yes. I, I think, Temu, I think this person, he was first. Okay, so let's ask two questions, one after another, so, because we don't have that much time. So please, two uh, questions. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. My name is Harry Allen, and I'm a philosopher working on the explanation of human behavior. And I have a question for the whole panel, but I want to begin by pushing back a little bit against the things Eric said in his opening talk. Um, and I just think it's a little bit disingenuous to present the sort of, oh, economists are sort of hated by everybody in the world and sort of we are hunted down by these sort of The Guardian and other papers. Um, I mean, I'm sure that's true, but just as an anecdotal example, there's, you know, US schools are banning the teaching of evolution and nobody's sort of banning the teaching of, of economic theory. Um, and so I, I think in a way, sort of, the, the, my, my objection really is that in a way you, you underestimate the problem, I think, that some, or the way you present it underestimates the problem that some of the criticisms are trying to bring home. It's that 
economics affects the world and economists affect the world in a variety of ways. And, and as Sixten Korkman was pointing out, not all people who are labeled economists have are working in academia, so they're not doing research in, in economics. And um, and sort of this brings me sort of on to sort of my second point. So there's economics, as you yourself point out, influences a lot of policymakers, and in that way, it, it has such a major, major influence on the world. But if you don't, if you haven't, say, done a PhD in economy, then you haven't, or economics, then you haven't really sort of faced the the anybody who does a PhD faces the limits of what their science can do and can say. Um, and so there's a lot of people with training in economy, say a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, which is fantastic, but they don't necessarily have a very critical understanding or a critical take, um, but they still go on to make policy advice uh, or sort of, um, yeah, and, and influence the world in, in these ways. Um, and sort of this brings on to my second point, which is that some of the criticisms aren't really about sort of uh, that are pushed on economists is really that the mathematical models that mainstream economy is operating with don't necessarily track anything in the world, in the actual world, or they sort of get things really wrong because a lot of economists present economics as a natural science or they want to sort of, they really rely on an idea of, oh, well, we have mathematical models that model the world, but human behavior is not something that's so simple like particles and atoms that can be modeled quite so simply. So, so some of the criticism, I think, is, is legitimately directed at economics as sort of the way mainstream economics is done is very mathematical, and that might just be sort of wrong, or it's at least sort of not so simple. And so this is sort of uh, build up to, to the more positive question to the entire panel is if economics can save the world, is the thought that economics, in a way, should be taken away from mainstream economists or, or mainstream economics, and, and we should think of, of, of economics like we think of the environment or we think of health. So when we study the environment, there's all kinds of sciences who contribute to our understanding of the environment or the, our understanding of health, and maybe economics in a similar way should sort of, and I think these are some of the moves that were being made on the panel that we should sort of bring in psychology and sociology and philosophy and all of these other disciplines to sort of broaden what economics really is and sort of really see it as a, as a, um, a broad approach to, to the topic. Thank you. Thank you. I, I and think, sorry, I'm going to forget the, if I don't address it right away, can I just quickly? Quickly. So you started off by accusing me of being disingenuous, but you mischaracterized my views. So the way you put it was that everybody hates us, and that's not what I said at all. I gave some very specific, concrete examples with URLs, right, of specific things that people say in these uh, places. I gave you a long list of books, and I said that this is as far as I know, unique among the sciences with the possible exceptions of evolutionary theory and maybe chemistry. Um, I think I, I would stand behind those claims. When it comes to the influence of economics, it, I mean, we, there, there's a case to be made that economists have too much influence, but it's not obviously true. When you think about the climate change um, example, for example, um, economists came up, like thousands of economists signed this statement. They put up a website, they started an organization, they bought whole page, page ads in the Wall Street Journal. They were really trying to get word out of this proposal to deal with um, climate change. And the effect of it was a couple of articles over a couple of days, and then it's completely been memory hold. Um, if economists have the kind of influence that you're suggesting, uh, it seems like how can they be so horribly inefficient at getting word out? And then when it comes to the simplicity of physics, I think your colleagues in the physics department would disagree that like particles are simple. I sit in on uh, uh, seminars and string theory and stuff, and uh, you know, simple is not the word I would use to describe. I mean, that's just not true. Let's ask the last question very briefly. Uh, do we have time for uh, two very short questions? Well, or, or we no? almost don't, but I, there are two people in the audience who would like to ask. Yes. Okay, but very briefly. Sorry. I'll, I'll be there. 
my name is Kalle and I'm a student of economics here at Helsinki University and this is actually my question has a lot to do with the previous question in a sense that this has been a very insightful talk about what we as a we economists should learn from other disciplinaries however I feel that the problem is also bi-directional that my friends here at the uh, Department of Social Sciences and Department of Humanities uh, they lack certain pro uh, basic information about economics and view it as a almost nefar nefarious model that justifies the evils of the world. <laughs> and uh, uh, my question for the panel is that uh, for other disciplinaries, what should they know about economics so that they are better when they critique it, but when, when they also apply it? Thank you. Thank you. And one last question. I had the last one here, so uh, this one is from online, so thank you for an interesting talk. My question is for the whole panel. I'm a master's student in education, and education and future are inseparable. Currently, OECD has a great role in drawing uh, uh, the educational policy. Since economy doesn't have sufficient weight on the future generations, what are your thoughts about having an economy-driven organization planning the educational policy? Can we consider a different priority, for example, mental well-being driven organization for planning the educational policy? Thank you. Let's engage with the two questions. Who would like to start? Mina. Oh, yeah, for all the students, um, don't think about what happens in three or four years that you have to graduate fast, um, please explore uh, the university and the academia. You're going to be the thinkers of the future. You, you need to kind of know how, to, how the world functions. And, and it was actually unfortunate that in, in the University of Turku, um, when I studied economics and social policy, they were in the same um, faculty, and now they are not. And I know that the students of social policy do not study economics as much anymore. And I always say to the students, that please study either economics or law or both. Because I think what we've not discussed today is how much um, law means and, and the property, property rights, social rights means how we plan our, our societies. And about PhD in economics, I think PhD in any uh, science gives you um, a lot of self-criticism, a lot of ways to criticize others, and, and also build a better future, of course. Um, yeah, I'll give the floor to others. Maybe I can uh, continue on the, on the question about uh, kind of mathematics and modeling. And I, I think it's a, it's a um, relevant critique, and, uh, and I think there is an issue when, like, for example, we have this very powerful uh, tools such as data to, to grunge data and if you don't really, you know, you can get any kind of numbers but if you don't understand any, you know, what is the, the theory or framework you're trying to test, it doesn't really tell anything and I think we should really, I think it's great that we uh, economists use data but you have to use very widely and you always need to understand what are the limitations, what you can and cannot say and, and trying to understand, go behind the numbers, what do they tell? It's, it's never just a number, you have to try to explain that. And I think any framework, you know, cost-benefit analysis that you mentioned, they are powerful frameworks, but it's, it can only deliver so much that, you know, depending on what goes in, and if you are, for example, uh, appraising, doing appraisal on, on urban infrastructure, and if you don't understand that trees, you know, clean air and they uh, uh, provide shelter uh, and help with the he uh, heat, or they help with the um, management of water, surface water, you know, if you don't understand, it doesn't go into your model, and then, you know, you get a certain answer, but it's not a perfect because you didn't understand what else could be in there, so I think always to be humble, understand the limitation of any, any analysis you do, it's, it's super important. 
Well, if I say something in reverse order, I understood the last question to concern the role of edu uh, economics in planning education. I'm not sure. But anyway, yeah, in that field, I would say there's a lot of excellent research done on the return of, of uh, on investment in education, in human capital, which could be used and, in fact, is used. I would say the Ministry of Education in Finland I is publishing rather good reports so-called civis to scots house mm -hmm. uh, you could have a look at it it contains a lot of useful material unfortunately more or less neglected by uh, the political decision makers uh, we still have something to work on in, in order to get them to really pay attention to the evidence-based uh, advice that they can get uh, to the question of Karl, i would agree very much that that it would be good we, we should have basic economics at the school level and we should have it for everybody who's studying at the university uh, basic course in economics at least, because that hill gives you quite a lot already. Uh, on this mathematics, uh, I think it's just a language, uh, a useful language, but of course sometimes it does happen that it carries you away. And, and uh, for instance, when in the debate about the financial crisis, there was a lot of heatful debate among uh, great economists on the matter, and, and it was m the observation was made that that monetary economics and financial economics, mac the macroeconomics of the day, relied on highly sophisticated math mathematical models, which had the feature that a financial crisis could not possibly take place in those models. Well, that's not very helpful if you if you uh, are planning for actions against the financial crisis. So it does I it is a problem if you get too excited about the mathematical properties. So. Uh, and uh, finally, issue about when economists are in the public domain. I think you shouldn't always blame just the economist. You should blame the media, because the media, they are picking the people, and then they are asking them all kinds of stupid questions, so that if you are a so-called expert, they, know, they won't ask you only about what you are an expert on, suppose. They will ask you anything. And it's very difficult to be in front of the camera and say that, well, actually, I don't know about this. Actu I'm not competent to answer your question. Uh, so most people fall for the temptation to try to say something, and that's disingenuous, but I would blame the media partly. Yeah, you'll never be invited back if you say I don't <laughs> know the answer, right? So when it comes to mathematics, and what strikes me is that it really can be quite useful, and I give some examples in the book of situations where it's helped us make real progress towards solving real problems, but it's a good language only if both people using it understand it, right? It's fine when one economist talks to another, but it becomes a massive problem if you're trying to use it when communicating the results of your, your research to a broader pod, um, uh, public, and that's where I think there's oftentimes like, a massive breakdown. We need to be much better at translating the stuff that we do into a language that's actually accessible. And to the point of what, what one should read and what one should know, I want to preface this by saying that it goes both ways, right? Economists are ignorant of anthropology in the same way probably as, you know, anthropologists are ignorant of, of economics and whatever. And I'm not going to tell you to read my book, but um, I will mention that there's a um, there's some references to books written by legit e economists, not like philosophers slash economists like like myself, about specific problems like poverty and norms and happiness and overconfidence and whatnot, and they're they're great. Um, feel free to recommend them to your friends, hand them out, uh, and so on. I think they'll enjoy it. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for the fruitful conversation. Thank you to the speakers, uh, to audience that you stayed with us uh, for two hours, but there are drinks after the meeting. So I hope you will stay for a little while longer and you won't regret uh, <laughs> that you <laughs> spend time discussing economics uh, with us just before the long weekend in Vapu, so there is a little reward. Thank you so much for the RESES uh, group for making this event um, possible. And please also check the RESES uh, website, because there are a few upcoming events organized by the project. Uh, by the end of May, there will be a discussion about the home care allowance that is probably interesting for the Finnish public. So please go to the website and check other events that are organized. Uh, so thank you very much again. I joined the evening, the drinks and the long weekend and Vapu and Labor Day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.